Good morning. Welcome to Stony Creek United Methodist Church on this third Sunday of Lent. I'm Pastor Michael. I'm very happy to see you all here on what currently is a nice day. We'll see if Mother Nature lets us have it, or really lets us have it. Um, <laughs> before we get to our worship service, do we have announcements or anything we need to go over? Anybody? Anyone? Just remember, there are coffee after church today. And the Monday morning Bible study is starting the book of Mark, uh, Mark and we'll do in chapters 1 through 5. Okay, anything else? Sorry. Good morning. Uh, just to let you know, put on your radar screen that not only is Easter coming, but we will have an Easter breakfast fellowship, and that will be before the service. And next week I'll have further information on the exact time and a sign-up sheet, but your food donations of fruit cobbler, fruit, muffins, breakfast casserole, what have you, start thinking what you might want to share, or otherwise just bring yourself, but more details on Easter breakfast will be coming. Okay. Yes, sir. We didn't have, theoretically, we didn't have any foods ahead of time, so make sure that you stay after and have some of the stuff that uh, people have made, okay? All right. Anything else? Going once, twice, sold. All right. Well, that is some of the business ministry, the fun stuff we do around here. If you ever have a question about it, please reach out to either myself or whoever you heard speaking about it. If you don't know their name, just run up and tap them on the shoulder. And if it's me, just yell out free coffee and I'll turn around. Um, all right. I'm going to turn things over to our praise band to get us started. Okay. Please join us with a red folder. Grab one in front of you in the pew or in a pew nearby. Turn to number six. And I didn't mention it to the praise band this morning. This is one of the very first songs that we learned as a group years ago. So number six, we'll stand together and we'll sing this twice. And then for our second song this morning, we have a communion anthem to share. And so you can be seated for the second song. First song is Lord, I Lift Your Name on High. We'll sing it twice.
Gracious God, whose power is made perfect in weakness, whose wisdom appears as foolishness in this world, we thank you for the scandalous of the cross. In Jesus Christ, you overrun all our usual ways of behaving and believing. You scatter our false notions. Discipleship is easy as coins are spilt from the box. Your correct notions of pity and order, fierce and passion. Do not let your church become content or content in its institution. Raise the ruins that have distorted our us and raise us to new life as a community so that we may be the body of Christ in and for the world. With fear and joy, we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> the house of God is a marketplace for buying and selling. It is a house of prayer, a place of hearing and restoration, a place where we bring before God our provisions to be used for present needs. Let us bring our tithes and offerings to God. Thank you. 
Please rise as you are able and join in our doxology number 95 in the Red Hymnal. to follow all your commandments, to love only you, not worship the things of this world, to love our neighbors freely, to desire for ourselves something they possess, except these offerings we pray and teach us to be generous, give faithful to ourselves that we may be true to the body of Christ in this world, amen. Now, please be seated, and now is the time for all of God's children. I'd like to invite our children and you to come hang out. Remember, you are all God's children, so everyone is invited to come up and hang out. Yeah, if you want something out of the bowl you've, or the coffee cup, you've got to come up. We'll see. How's everybody doing this morning? Yeah? Good. Okay. So, I want to read you guys a story about Mary and Martha. Do you know who Mary and Martha are? No. They're sisters. Yeah, they're related, and their brother is Lazarus, but we're not going to talk about him yet today. And they were also two of Jesus' good friends. See, they're all hanging out together. All right, so, Jesus and his followers were traveling and they needed a place to rest. Jesus' friends, Mary and Martha, invited Jesus to stay with them. When Jesus arrived, Mary sat at his feet to listen to him and Martha served everyone. Martha was tired. She was doing all of the work while Mary was just sitting and enjoying Jesus' company. Martha thought this was unfair. Jesus, it's not fair that Mary is not helping. Tell her to help me, said Martha. Martha, what Mary is doing is important, Jesus says. Mary has chosen to listen closely to me to learn about God. Sometimes it is better to sit and be with me. So I wonder, how do you listen to God? Is anybody going to explain that there's a book right there? That there's a, there's like a don't worry about it. How do you listen to God? Well, my ears. Okay. And my mind. Okay. How do you listen to God? How do you wait to just hear him? Yeah, okay. You know, you know how I hear God? I hear God through other people. When, when someone else will say something and I realize it's not them saying it, it's God saying it. And I think God likes to talk to us the way that we're most likely to hear God. So it's different for everybody. So just because one person experiences it one way doesn't mean that's the only way, okay? Can you guys help me with the repeat after me prayer? Dear God, Dear God, thank you, thank you for, calling for calling us to listen, to listen and, to learn and to learn more about you, more about you and, your loving grace. and your loving grace. Amen. Amen. You guys are awesome. We're not going to do the Lord's Prayer right now because we're going to do it later during communion, but I have a surprise for you. Come check out the coffee mug. Wait a minute. Wait, why do we it though? Because I was tired of seeing the same suckers, so. How many can we get? Uh, let's go with two each. Yes. Okay. 
See, so if you guys would come up, there's Laffy Taffy, there's Tootsie Pops, Tootsie Rolls, Dots. I'm just saying, there's all you got to do. You can even sit like in the pews. You don't have to sit on the floor. Um, if the rest of you would rise as you are able and join in our next hymn, it's in the thin black hymnal of faith we sing. It's number 2004. I forgot the name of it, but it's 2004. Now is the time that we bring before God and God's people the things that weigh upon our hearts and our minds, as well as those that cause us, uh, gives us cause for celebration. Um, this morning, in addition uh, to the prayers that I know you will be lifting, um, I'd like to uh, first lift up Sue Adamski. Um, she was taken to the hospital yesterday. Um, they're still working out all what's going on. Um, Kristen did let me know this morning that they've got, gotten 6,000 cc's of liquid out of her, um, which is good that that's happening, um, but I imagine she's going to be there uh, for a couple days. So um, when I know more, I will obviously let you all know more, but please keep Sue and Kristen, obviously, in your prayers. Um, and obvious, and also continue prayers for Sandy um, as she is uh, still healing. Um, do we have other joys and concerns we'd like to lift up this morning?
Uh, before I get to me, <laughs> uh, pray for my friend Jane that had uh, two thirds of her lung, right lung removed. They, she thought it was only a quarter, but it's two thirds. And she's still healing. Um, it's going to take a long time for her to get over this. And also for uh, Dee Washington, she's our pianist for music makers at the community center. She's 94 years old. And I just learned last night that she's also in the hospital. But she's just had a lot of different medical things at her age. Uh, this Wednesday, I am going to be having my left knee replaced. So pray that everything goes well. And I can, I'm going to watch you on Facebook for the next few weeks. So. I'd just like to recognize and have you recognize my daughter, Mrs. Jill. Uh, she's going to be in Stony Creek for a while anyhow. <laughs> she thinks it's going to be a long time, but we'll see. I ask for prayers for an unnamed person. Um, as asking for prayers for my roommate, Liz. Uh, she is having a minor brain procedure on the 11th. And if that one doesn't work, she's having somewhat major brain surgery the day after. I know I'm not a member here, but all prayers are welcomed. Two dear, dear friends, Lola and Karen, both lost their spouses this week. Thank you. Okay. Um, if you would turn in the black hymnal to number 2039 for our invitation to prayer. No, are we doing invitation or response? Whoops, my bad. Okay, never mind. Just hold on to that. Please join me in an attitude of prayer. Holy God, you have called us to live before you and with one another in all faithfulness. Unable to live as you intend, we inflict harm and hurt on others and on ourselves as well. In all these ways, we know we grieve your heart also. Hear then our prayers of intercession. Restore us to communion with you and one another, that we might live in the freedom you have bestowed. We pray for people who are victims of crime, from petty theft to murder. We pray that those harmed will find healing and will dwell in safety. Hold especially close to your heart, O oh God, those who have lost a loved one to violence and help us to offer tenderness and care in their struggles and grief. We pray also for those who have committed crimes that they may seek and find forgiveness and begin a new life of responsibility and integrity before you and in the community. We pray for healing and reconciliation where trust has been broken, hostility has flared, or misunderstanding has grown. Restore us not only to one another, but reconcile us to ourselves and to you, loving God. If restoration proves beyond hope, then grant new beginnings and possibilities for all. In every relationship, we seek your grace as we honor others by caring for them, being truthful, and working for their welfare. Root out in us any jealousy toward what others possess and let generosity grow in and among us instead. Gracious God, we pray for those who are ill in mind, body, or spirit, for those lonely and isolated from community, for those burdened 
by guilt or grief, by depression or despair. We especially lift up this morning Sandy and Sue, Liz and Jane and Dee. We lift up Lo and Karen. We lift up all of those who will be undergoing medical procedures in the coming days. We ask that you would watch over the hands and efforts of the doctors, the nurses, the surgeons, and all those who are working in the healing and process. Give them strength and guidance. And Lord, do not let us turn inward as a church, lest we shut out or neglect those who long for a community of welcome and companionship. Loving God, we thank you for the blessings you bestow upon us in our lives. We thank you for family and friends, for opportunities to celebrate anniversaries and birthdays. We especially thank you for bringing Jill back home to Bob. And we are very blessed with her presence in us, with us in our community. And we pray that we will be able to also be a blessing to her. Send us out in love with open eyes, ears, and hearts. Make us true neighbors to one another and true children of your own calling. We pray in the name of Christ who has come to set us free. Amen. And if you would please join me aloud in our prayer for illumination. God of glory, we cannot... Oh, hold on, back up. I forgot our response to prayer. If you would turn in your... See what happens if you would turn to 2039 in the faith we sing we are going to sing verse one of holy holy and we're going to sing it twice through Apologies, I only had one cup of coffee. Now, if you would please join me aloud in our prayer for illumination. God of glory, we cannot hear the heavens proclaim your handiwork, though the speech of the skies must be magnificent. We cannot hear what day and night are singing about you, though their song must be both bright and deep. Yet somehow you are made known to us for our own foolish proclamation. It is only by the power of the Holy Spirit that your word can be heard in our words. Open our ears to what you are saying to us today, we pray. And perhaps we may also hear echoes of your glory in the broad firmament above. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our first scripture reading this morning is from Psalm 19. And in the Pew Bible, it's on pages 541 and 542. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speeches, nights after nights they reveal knowledge. They have no speech, they use no words, no sound is heard from them. 
yet their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the end of the world. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a bridegroom coming out of its chamber, like a champion rejoicing to And his course, it raises at one of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The status of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise and simple. The percepts of the Lord are all right, giving joy to the heart. The commandments of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decease of the Lord's are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them your servants is warned, warmed, and kept them there is great rewards. But who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servants also from wild, willful sin. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. May these were willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgressions. May those words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to in your sight, my rock and my redeemer. This is the word of God for the people of God. Now, now if you're able, would you stand for hymn 614 in the hymnal for the bread which you have broken. Our second scripture reading for today can be found on page 1051. We are in the second chapter of John's Gospel, looking at verses 13 through 22. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered what is written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then responded to him, What sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, 
and you are going to raise it in three days? The temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. This is the word of God for the people of God. Please join me once again in an attitude of prayer. God of all understanding and love, we come to you ashamed of our own actions and words, as well as those of others, especially when those words and actions lead to the oppression of others, when those words and actions create injustice against our neighbors. Help us to see each other the way that you see us as your beloved children, siblings with Jesus Christ. Help us to change our ways, our views, our hearts, Through the power of the Holy Spirit, inspire us to love all people and to work against oppression and injustice wherever we may encounter it. And now may the words of my mouth and meditations of our hearts together in this place be pleasing in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. And if you've ever wondered where I get those words from, you now know it's from Psalm 19. All right, so... Originally, I had planned to start my message today highlighting some statistics about anger and identify some examples of anger for all of you. And then I thought about it for a moment, and it occurred to me that you all already know about anger, not because of your age or your personality traits. You No anger because you live in Michigan. As someone who did not grow up in our beautiful state, I'd like to offer to you an outsider's perspective on some things that that just seem to bring about anger for many Michiganders, at least from the things I've witnessed. And I'm not doing this to call anyone out or try to say that this is bad behavior, not at all. Everyone gets angry at some point, some more than others, but we all experience anger. Okay, so the first thing that I think makes the people of Michigan familiar with anger is the Detroit Lions. Now, I know they just had a great season. They went to the playoffs, but but come on. By making the playoffs this year, the Lions broke a seven-year streak of not making the playoffs. That's not too horrible, I guess. But what about the 13-year streak from the late 50s into the early 70s? Or how about the 17-year playoff drought from 1935 until 1952? In 94 seasons, 1930 through 2023, the Lions have a playoff record of nine wins and 14 losses. 23 playoff games in 94 seasons. That works out to just under one playoff game every four years on average and one or less than one playoff win every 10 seasons. Are you angry yet? I could also go into how the team essentially wasted the career of Barry Sanders. In his 10 seasons, all with the Detroit Lions, they made the playoffs five times. And in those five playoffs, the Lions won one game. One. Now, granted, it was against the Dallas Cowboys, so that does help take some of the sting away. But still, come on, one game? And again, I'm from Chicago, and the Bears, they'd have nothing to get excited about in this realm, especially in my lifetime. They, they allegedly won the Super Bowl when I was about three, but I don't remember that because I was too little, so I don't think it counts. All right, we'll get off the Lions for right now. How about we talk about, how about we talk about just how much you all love the state of Ohio? No? Nobody? I'm shocked. Shocked! I have to admit that some of the funniest things I have seen or heard in my time living in Michigan have been about how the people of Michigan feel about Ohio and its residents. I know there's a long history there, but, but some of the comments I have heard are just absolutely hysterical. In fact, 
I think my favorite part of this rivalry um, that I have experienced so far had to do with a billboard. Now, I can tell you I was in Michigan. I don't remember which highway I was on or what direction I was going, but I know I was in Michigan. And I saw a billboard that was split vertically in two halves. The left-hand side, this for you guys, was this beautiful scene, the clouds and sunlight and even a kind of a faded image of like the pearly gates, just like what we might think heaven could look like. And, and it said, are you going to heaven? And then the other half, the right-hand side, there was fire, flames, and darkness, and kind of scary. And on that side it says, or are you going to Ohio? <laughs> I almost drove off the road because I was laughing so hard and had an asthma attack. <laughs> Anger can be a very powerful emotion for us. Remember what Master Yoda told Luke. Fear leads to anger, anger leads to hate, hate leads to suffering. For a 900-year-old Muppet, that's pretty insightful, even outside of the Star Wars galaxy. And anger, whether it's driven by, by a sense of unfairness or mistreatment or something else, anger really has been behind some of the worst human-made disasters in history. If you look back at almost any major event in history that involved a great loss of life, major suffering for a group of people, anything in that realm, anger was at least a part of the driving force behind it. Human anger can be devastating, painful. It opens us up to all kinds of suffering, even potential medical issues depending on your health and just how angry you are. So we should just stop being angry, right? Just never let ourselves become angry ever again. Yeah, we'll come back to that. I want to jump back into our gospel reading for a few moments um, that we just heard from John's gospel in the second chapter. In this famous passage of scripture, we, we have Rabbi Jesus engaging in, in a number of, of symbolic activist efforts, entering the temple courts and overturning tables. Jesus wasn't just expressing his anger at how the temple was being used. He was also showing really at once a profound lack of respect for the powers that controlled the operations of the temple, both the political and the religious powers. At the same time, though, Jesus was also showing a profound respect for the true religion that Jesus' brother James later will, will write, that is, to care for orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. <clears throat> Excuse me. Almost everybody, we like to try and keep Jesus in, in that warm and fuzzy Jesus, the one who welcomes the little children to come to him, the one who's, you know, healing the sick. We don't, we don't always like the angry Jesus. but he was. This passage alone proves how Jesus experienced the whole gamut of human emotions during his earthly life. Jesus even got hangry. He cursed a fig tree because there was no fruit for him to eat from. And they didn't have Snickers back then, so what was he to do? Now, now one of the core themes in the life and teaching of Jesus was really highlighting the ways in which the Jewish religious system in Jerusalem had become this, this force of oppression and wickedness instead of liberation and love. 
He was quick to expose the unjust ways of the religious authorities and call them to, to a posture of sacrifice, something Jesus was quite aware very few of them would actually accept. You see, by carrying out this, this dramatic demonstration in the temple courts, Jesus had surely caught the attention of not only the patrons in the temple that day, but also the religious leaders and the government officials who would have immediately tried to put an end to his demonstration lest he cause a riot or, you know, inspired the people to push back against all of the injustice and oppression they were facing. They fixed their gaze on him. Jesus declared, destroy this temple and I will rebuild it in three days. That's a mic drop moment. Now, now the author of, our, of this gospel tells us that Jesus was cryptically prophesying about what would be done to his body in his inevitable crucifixion and subsequent resurrection. And that is most likely true. I'm not, you know, arguing against that. At the same time, though, I do believe there is also a deeper meaning contained in this passage. Here, Jesus is making is making a statement that is reiterated time and time again throughout the New Testament that the Spirit of God does not dwell in temples or systems or organizations. The Spirit of God dwells in flesh and blood human beings. Jesus' kind of double meaning in this passage is that this temple, it's really not that important after all. It could be destroyed, and it would be rebuilt in his very body, the vessel through which the Spirit of God actually dwells. But wait, there's more. Because Jesus also, also prophesies many times about the physical destruction that would one day come to the physical temple. He was well aware that this sacred place would only be around for a short time, and he was really trying to help people realize they didn't need the temple and all of its trappings. They didn't need that to be connected to God. In fact, the temple and, and everything that it represented really had become a hindrance to the people connecting with the divine. And in reality, it had become this force of oppression and injustice. Huh, how about that? The temple, a religious place and system, had become a force of oppression and injustice. I wonder what that must have been like. I mean, what might that possibly look like? The church oppressing marginalized groups of people and, and committing acts of injustice against those most in need? Hmm. Anyway, so when Jesus speaks of destroying the temple, as radical as it would have sounded to his listeners, because again, they point out it took 46 years to build that temple, and this was the second time around because the first time it got destroyed during the Babylonian exile. So this would have sounded just incredible to those there that day. He was also hinting at a deeper reality, that institutions, religion, and hierarchies were not necessary at all, not even remotely necessary. Jesus was hinting that God was available to all and through all. If only we could open our eyes 
and behold. Wait a minute, did I just say that God was available to all? Even the people who don't tithe at least 10%? Even the people who only come on, on Easter and Christmas Eve? Even all the people that the church has tried to exclude because of a wildly incorrect interpretation of Scripture says they should be? How can this be possible? I'll tell you the answer. The answer is grace. Grace is how this is possible. Grace, the loving act of sacrifice by Jesus for all creation, that is what makes God available to all people. Grace is what defies badly translated scripture passages. Grace is what stands up to things like racism and sexism and the exclusionist behaviors and actions of others. So then I have to ask, what if this Lent, what if we gave up hatred? What if we gave up fear of others that is grounded in, in falsehood and lies? What if we gave up settling for a life that includes massive oppression and exclusion of marginalized groups of people. For me, I think it would be a radical change. But also a radical change that falls perfectly in line with what Jesus was preaching and teaching. I think it would be a radical way of showing love to everyone. So then I just have one more question. Who's ready to get radical? Amen. If you would please turn to pages 15 and 16 in the hymnal as we prepare to celebrate Holy Communion. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. In love you made us for yourself, and when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, your love remained steadfast. You bid your faithful people cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Easter feast that renewed by your word and sacraments and fervent in prayer and works of justice and mercy, we may come to the fullness of grace that you have prepared for those who love you. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent in the fullness of time to redeem the world. He emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in our likeness. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. He took upon himself our sin and death and offered himself a perfect sacrifice for the sin of the whole world. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. The night in which he gave himself, or, <clears throat> excuse me, in the same way also, when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. 
And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit in us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine and juice. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, with the confidence of children of God, let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. The bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. The cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. In the United Methodist Church, we practice open communion. And what that means is that this table doesn't belong to me, to this church, to our denomination. This table belongs to Christ and Christ alone. And he has invited everyone to come and partake. It doesn't matter your race, your ethnicity. You don't need to be a member of our congregation or any other congregation or denomination. You don't need to be baptized. It doesn't matter your sexual orientation. All those ways we like to divide ourselves from one another, those boxes we cram each other into, it's not what he sees. Jesus looks out and sees siblings, beloved children of God, all he asks is that when you partake in this, this sacrament, is to do so with an open heart. This morning when we celebrate communion, you will be dismissed in your rows and come forward. You'll be given a piece of bread and there will be a cup of, I think we just have, do we have both or just one? The juice? Just the juice, okay. Um, and you can then receive your elements one of two ways. One way is intinction, which is just a really big word that means you take your bread, you dip it in the juice, and you take them together. Your other option would be to eat the bread and then drink the juice. Neither one is more special or anything like that. It's just two of the ways that have developed in our faith over time. What matters is that you are participating in the sacraments, that you are coming with an open heart, that you want to encounter Jesus. Brothers and sisters, the table has been set. Come and taste that God is good.
Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. If you would rise as you are able for our closing hymn, it is in the faith we sing the thin black hymnal number 2112, Jesus Walked This Lonesome Valley. Beloved children of God, precious siblings of Christ Jesus, in the Lenten week ahead, study God's commandments, practice the way of life they teach, and see how God's laws revive your soul. In the Lenten week ahead, find time and space to listen for God's glory as it is spoken in the world around you. And now may God shine upon you, Christ fill you with true wisdom and strength, and the Holy Spirit guide you into all faithfulness now and forever. Amen. Mm -hmm.